All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 3, Section 2, Colonial Rivalries, Dutch and French Colonial Ambitions. So in Chapter 2, we talked a little bit about both the French and the Dutch and how they explored the New World. Of course, their colonies in the New World are appropriately named New France and New Netherland. Both the Dutch, or sorry, both the Dutch and the French are interested in making money via the fur trade in the new world. So we might say of the fur trade, this is a way for France and Netherlands to make money. And when it comes to the title of this section, rivalries, that is probably the biggest rivalry between both the French and the Dutch, is they're both trying to make money off of, it, off of this fur trade. Another similarity between both of them is that both the Dutch and the French colonies don't really track a lot of migrants or colonists. So the numbers of French people and the numbers of Dutch people remain relatively low in the New World, especially compared to England. And in terms of where they're located, again, this is review. The Dutch are located along the Hudson River in New York. So this is where the Dutch are. Modern day New York is where the Dutch are. And the uh, French are located along the St. Lawrence River in Eastern Canada, right? French. One other thing that we ought to take note of in terms of the French is that they really went the extra mile to explore the interior of the Americas. Uh, they probably went further than any other colonial power in penetrating into the interior of the Americas. So even places like the Mississippi River were explored by the French, right? Explored by the French, where the Dutch remain relatively close to the coast uh, and the English remain relatively close to the coast. The French are really busy um, exploring many of the rivers in the Americas. So let's go ahead and take a look at New Netherland first. One important thing to take note of about the Netherlands is that by the 1600s, the Dutch, or you know, Amsterdam, the city in more particular, was really the commercial center of the world. And what we mean by that is commercial, think of commerce, think of trade, right? The Dutch were very, very wealthy. In fact, most money that the Dutch made was not in the New World, but from Eastern trade. So we might say of Eastern trade, the Dutch made more money in the East. And in fact, one of the reasons why the Dutch colonies, New Netherland and New Amsterdam, why they remain really low in number is because when there's somebody in the Netherlands looking to make money, there's like 10 better alternatives. Um, Eastern trade or the Dutch East India Company is much more wealthy than the Dutch West India Company. For the Dutch West India Company, this is the company that does trade. Remember, it's a joint stock company that does trade in, we'll say the New World, New World, New Amsterdam, right? This was the capital of the Dutch colony. So you might say capital city, capital city. And the Dutch occupied the island of Manhattan, right? So this was a Dutch possession. Interestingly enough, when the Dutch arrived, they needed to build a protective wall. Uh, we can actually see that on this image here. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of the Dutch colony, and here's a protective wall to guard them from Native Americans. Interestingly enough, that is where uh, today, where Wall Street is. So that's just kind of a, uh, a fun fact about the Dutch settlement. Now, one thing that we talked about previously in terms of the Dutch motives, now this should be review, but if we don't remember, um, then it's not a problem. We'll remind ourselves that when it came to the motivations for the Dutch, they were all about the money, right? The Dutch were really just looking to make money. They didn't really have very strong religious motivations. They didn't have motivations to resettle. It was really all about the bottom line. And so that meant that for the Dutch, wherever there was potential to make money, um, the Dutch would be there, essentially. Now, fur trading was 
one way of doing it, but another way of doing it was through the slave trade. And that is to say that the Dutch West India Company and other Dutch uh, trading companies uh, used the slave trade to make a lot of money. In fact, like we mentioned before, the Dutch colony itself remained at relatively low population. That meant that there was a lack of labor. And some of that labor was filled in with African slaves. And interestingly enough, we don't typically think of a northern city like New York as being a center of African slavery. But when the Dutch controlled New York, New York City was the second most populated city in North America in terms of African slaves. And that is some you know, remnant of the, uh, of the Dutch presence there and the way that the Dutch took over the slave trade. In fact, of the slave trade, initially it was Portuguese factories that brought the first African slaves over to the New World. The Dutch took over much of Portugal's, um, much of Portugal's economy uh, and even their factories or their trading posts in West Africa. So we might say Dutch took over slave trade from Portugal. In fact, this wall was built by slaves, by African slaves. So uh, New York had a uh, dense and high slave population relative to the other parts of the Americas because of the ways that the Dutch had taken over the slave trade. Now, one thing that was also true about the colony of New Netherland was that, again, because it was essentially all about the money, there was a degree of religious toleration that you couldn't find really anywhere else in the New World at the time. So we might say of religious tolerance, we might say New Netherland welcomed religious minorities. You know, for example, for countries like Spain and France, and to a certain degree, England, it was all about whether one was a Catholic or a Protestant. But for example, if you were a European Jew and wanted to go to the New World, well, really the place that you would probably make your uh, destination would be New Netherland, because even minorities like uh, European Jews uh, were more welcome in New Netherland than, let's say, any of the English colonies, Spanish colonies, or the French colonies. And because of that, because the Dutch only really cared about the money, they got a lot of non-Dutch immigrants. Uh, in fact, a lot of English people moved there, Swedish, German. Um, we might say of the early Dutch society, it's sometimes referred to as like the first experiment in a plural society or a diverse society. Uh, we might say of New Netherland, we'll go ahead and just put this most diverse uh, colony in, we'll say, North America. And by that, we mean more languages are spoken there, uh, more cultures are there, more different religions are there than any other colony uh, there. Uh, but again, the colony still struggled. It really struggled to attract a large number of Dutch people. Uh, the Dutch did grant what were called patroon ships. A patroon is a large tract of land given to a wealthy Dutch merchant, right? So the Dutch West India Company was willing to give away land, really, really, really big pieces of land to Dutch merchants if, and this was the if, they agreed to move uh, people to the colony. So we might say large tract of land given to a wealthy Dutch merchant in exchange for, uh, we'll say, moving people to the colony. colony. And despite the effort by the Dutch West India Company, um, the population in New Netherland still remained relatively low, and most of the people that actually moved there ended up not even really being Dutch themselves and therefore had no really loyalty or allegiance to the colony of New Netherland. Uh, meanwhile, in New France, 
in terms of where we are geographically. We're talking about Eastern Canada. Quebec is the capital city of New France. Samuel de Champlain, we talked about him earlier. He is the early French explorer really responsible for establishing some of the new or some of the first French settlements, sometimes called the father of New France. And uh, for France, the, you know, the population of New France remained relatively low like that of the Netherlands, whereas for the Dutch, it was more about better economic opportunities elsewhere. For the French, it was the fact that, you know, Canada was mostly a frozen wasteland, as they described it. So we might say here, frozen wasteland, people did not want to live in New France, right? The climate wasn't quite right in that area. Uh, fur trading provided a huge source of revenue for the French there. And again, when it came to fur trading, it was really necessary for the French to maintain friendly relations. Recall, really the one sort of thing that we want to know about the French and their interactions in the New World is they had the best relations with the native population as compared to Spain, England, and the Netherlands. The Algonquian were allies to the French. However, the Algonquian were at war with the Iroquois. And in fact, when it came to the Algonquian, not only were they allies, but they were trading partners to the French. The Iroquois, they were an enemy, an enemy to the Algonquian, and therefore an enemy to the French. And they were trading partners with guess who? Not the French, but with the Dutch, right? With the Dutch. And so now we come full circle to this point about colonial rivalry. So not only does it involve the Dutch and the French, but it also involves the indigenous people who are responsible for going out and getting those furs. Remember, it's the Native Americans who hunt the furs, bring them to Europeans, and Europeans then trade typically goods like, you know, uh, metal tools, guns, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And so this sort of arms race between Algonquian and Iroquois ultimately led to the Beaver Wars. And these were wars between native peoples to trade with Europe or Europeans, right? So now the Algonquian and Iroquois not only fought one another, um, for you know, reasons dating before the arrival of the French and the Dutch. But with the arrival of the French and the Dutch, now each side are fighting each other over the prized possessions of beaver pelts, which are traded for superior weapons like guns. And guns obviously give weaker tribes the upper hand where they didn't have that previously. So you know, sort of this interconnectedness of the economy and politics and warfare really unfolds in, uh, you know, in the New World to involve both the Dutch and the French. In addition to fur trading, the French, more so than the Dutch, were also interested in conversion, a Jesuit or the Society of Jesus. The Society of Jesus is an organization of Jesuits. Uh, Jesuits. And a Jesuit is kind of like a, a model Catholic citizen. So we might say of a Jesuit is a model Catholic citizen. And their goal is to convert. This is happening in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. The Catholic Church has lost a lot of their members. And so as a result of the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church establishes the Society of Jesus to train model citizens who are dedicated to discipline, education, everything, you know, holy, and they really go out all over the world to find converts. So uh, the French send Jesuits, these very sort of hardcore, disciplined priests who are willing to live in this frozen wasteland 
uh, in order to find converts. So in terms of the French presence there, it pretty much breaks down into two, into two categories, and that is there are either people there trading for furs or there are French Jesuits looking for converts.